So today we're going to go over my process for recreating this pretty iconic scene from Studio Ghibli's Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind in Blender, and I'll give you some insight on my step-by-step -step process for this one. As always, the file for this project is available for download from my Ko-Fi Free for All members. With that said, let's get right into it. So firstly, we're going to talk about silhouette and shape, because that's pretty important. And for that, we're just going to go ahead and, and grab this little, little computer program called GIMP, and I'd recommend just dragging your reference imagery into Puree something else and all that, and just examine it. Take some time to do your studies on your reference image, because it's going to help your understanding of the different components of it. Alright, so we're going to look at the shape created, and we're going to notice how this outline actually terminates at the top of the image and doesn't go all the way. And now that we can see the kind of shapes of our lines, which is pretty evident, we're going to look at the actual space it's taking up. This is kind of like looking at the silhouette, which is pretty important. And we don't have to get this exactly right, I'm going to cover that a little bit more later, it's not about being perfect, but we're kind of going to want to make sure that things are positioned to create this sort of shape. Where if I hide this picture then we've still got this sort of thing going on, even if the details are slightly different. And now we're also going to take into account the idea of kuhaku, or negative space, and basically we can see that this stuff marked in yellow is going to be the shape created around our outline, and it's actually just as important as the shape created by our actual meshes, and it greatly informs the way that a audience will look around the image. And so you can see right here that I've actually already modeled this um, Titan head for the Rampage Rally render challenge, and I'm just doing a retexture of it, a pretty serious retexture of it, because I'm converting that um, rock texture that I used before to black and white, and then I'm actually mixing the texture from the O model which I made, which is something that I do suggest doing. If you create stuff that's in the same world or IP, then you can definitely use materials from that, because that ohm texture is kind of different from the gold, but it fits very well with the same world, and when combined with this rocky stuff, the re end result looks quite good, and it looks detailed enough that it kind of gives that hand-painted sort of vibe, you know? Mixing several more complicated textures together can create stuff that looks more human and hand-done. Or simply just creating a texture mask manually yourself can be a great approach. You can see I'm also using brushes to sculpt the basic terrain around, and that's just going to give us some nice variety and randomness. And once I've got those basic elements and you can see that I've got the reference up there, and I'm just trying to place the shapes roughly along the right rule of thirds lines and get the composition kind of lined up. Instead of looking at components individually, tone is created by your colour of each mesh and object combined with the lighting that you choose to use and the colours of those, and then also your white balance, and basically all of these elements work together to create a final tone, which you can then also obviously colour grade at the end, just over the final image. But it is nice to create yourself a good base and save yourself from work later on, because if you try and polish something which is really far away from what you intended, it can end up creating suboptimal results. So it's just nice to keep that final process in mind as you're doing it. That's just good general advice for this industry. Always keep in mind processes further down the pipeline, whether it's you doing them or somebody else who's going to have to do them on a group project or on a team. It's important to consider stuff later down in the pipeline because you can end up creating some pretty bad deficit which can be seen with many um, companies in real life. And I'll also make a point, as I kind of finish up assembling this model, that it's about capturing essence, and it's not really about exactness. You can see that the tilt of the helmet is, and that the foliage that is used doesn't actually mimic the t render extremely well. The terrain color as well, lots of the modeling details are just like slightly off and not quite the same, but I've ultimately created something which is very recognizably a take on this pretty iconic scene. And it's not one-to-one, -one, and I think that it would almost be worse if it was one-to-one. -one. I think that there's something to be said about creating something and then diverging a little bit. Not necessarily saying that like I'm trying to improve on it, you know, I'm trying to create something that is unique and special and somehow more cool. No, it's like, this is kind of like the me version of it a little bit. And there's not necessarily anything inherently superior, but it kind of is showing my ways and my defaults to expressing certain things, and I think that that's just a cool muscle to exercise and a cool activity to do. You can get a lot of the details wrong, but if you get the overarching ideas right and you have this, you've done your studies basically at the start, you've made sure that you've looked at the image and you know what's important, this shape language um, that has been chosen at the start and basically nailing the colors somewhat and getting the things just placed in the right spots. You've got the overarching processes correct, and so you'll be able to create something which feels right, but that you can modify to your own tune a little bit. But yeah, that's I guess most of what I wanted to say. And you can see here that with these um, little plants, these little fungi things, I've just gone through and used a hair particle system. They don't look great up close, but far away, they kind of blend into each other, especially when blurred, and they do kind of mimic the look. You can see that I also utilize proportional editing, just going in and sculpting a little bit, 
and by doing that sculpting it just allows me to el eliminate some of the regularities that have ended up becoming inherent with this model from the way that I created it. Just try to move away from that 3D look, make it look more splotchy, painted is ideal. But yeah, some kind of like smoothing over blurring and all of that in post is a, is a great idea for helping to work on these things. You can see that this is an initial render that I had, and this is without any of the color grading. And you can see that it's um, actually decently different from the kind of like goal in terms of colors and all of that. And the composition is a little bit off too, it's a little bit too zoomed in and big and slightly off. But this is already capturing a lot of that essence, you could probably tell it was that scene if I showed you it um, beforehand or if you were aware of the scene. You can see that I've got a variety of these little mask layers, kind of like lens like artifacts and dust and all of that piled up. Which isn't actually something that's that present in the anime, but it's just kind of a consideration of capturing imagery in this world. If there was a camera there, then this would probably happen, and it does just help to just masking that computer perfectionism as much as possible. Just getting it to look more human in any way that's that's kind of feasible and doesn't take away too much. And then obviously I've softened stuff a lot. Using a um, bloom pass with a very very high radius on it, so that it spreads out the bloom a lot. As you can see, this really softens things, and this is over the top, but that helps as well with the kind of like old style vintage anime look, and kind of desaturating in the right areas, saturating in the right areas. You don't need to actually make your white balance like too sharp. Um, as you can see, this curve includes everything, but there's actually quite a lot missing from the whites. Um, it's not way too bright. It's a little bit duller, and that just yeah again helps to um, fit that theme. You just you, you want to do the right color passes and tonal passes for the scene that you're doing, um, which is coming back to the earlier point. Character model, I will um, mention briefly, this was made custom, but it is just, as you can see, extracted from the um, body mesh, and then it's just had the same armature to form applied to it, and as you can see, I've added some extra little details to mimic um, what Nausicaa has, and then I created this gun model that is quite simple, as you can see, and you can see some process of me modeling this mask, which I actually made as part of the Rampage Rally thing again. And as you can see, a solidifier modifier, which is basically just puffing that out a little bit, giving it some volume. But yeah, that's all I'll say. So sorry for the break, it's been exam season. Well, kind of, it's been assignment season, group project season, and I've been doing a lot of Maya. I do plan on making some videos on that soon, but I'll keep the outro short. Thanks for sticking with me. If you're watching, thank you. And I hope to make some more videos soon. Um, again, sorry it's been taking a while. But I've got some interesting stuff lined up. I actually want to make some videos documenting what I make for weekly render challenges for Clint's server. Because there's quite a lot of variety in that and some cool tips I could maybe show you. So yeah, thanks so much for watching. It's been Yuzin, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.